my dear. How are you doing? I'm good. good Congrats. To see you. Your life must be a little better. Always immeasurably better for you for in this year. Um, but I think we're going to have a lot of people trickling in. So if you don't mind uh, kind of moving towards the center, as we'll try to fill in and minimize disruption as, as people come in. Thanks so much. So life is good for? Yes, it's good now that uh, now we have all the work to do. <laughs> and uh, the Where do we South stand Africa on our cycle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When so we have to launch that by the um, 29th of, of August. I mean, of July. What does launch mean? I didn't follow it that closely. Either. Yeah, so, so it just means that we have to put out the FR notice saying that we are officially launching that. And that kicks that, off the 30-day period? Or? No, no, that is that is the 30 days. We have to launch it. So the president signed the bill on the 29th of June. We have till the 29th of July to actually officially announce that we're starting the investigation. Let's oh, so you start the investigation. Is yeah, you can't, time right, you can't finish. Yeah, there were people that were confused. I was like, have you ever seen me just come right. finish something in 30 days? So it's 30 days to start. Is there an end? No, they, they didn't tell us when to end, which is a good thing. Right. What we're thinking, I'll just say it here, but what we're thinking is that we will align with the end of the curriculum period so that when we send the memo to the president, we'll have one on the South of Cycle and the other on the overall of over. We will say, here's what, here's, and these are the things we think need to happen on January 1st. Scott and I are. Um, talking today, probably going on the last week of July. Um, Scott Who Eisner. Is? Oh, yeah. So if there's stuff you want us to, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. we should we probably would, talk would, before yes, then. Yes, that we, would be very uh, good. We can go see Xavier or Davies and say, hey, these are. Well, you know, Xavier is in Geneva now. He's their oh, he ambassador. Moved, right. Yeah, he's their ambassador to the WTO. Who picked it up from? Um, I don't really know who did. They have a couple of people that they're working on. As, as uh, senior as him, is what I'm trying yeah. to say. Or, or as, capable, or... Yeah, uh, the, right, right. <laughs> Though we're happy to not have him. Right, because he's... In that, yeah, because he can be difficult. I like the man, but... Right. The person, but... Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, well, anybody who works for Rob is not going to be easy. Mm-mm. Uh -uh. Yeah. And have there been any conversations with him since the bill passed, or...? Um, so, um, so we're trying to get uh, Ambassador Froman to send out you know, letters and make a few phone calls and all of that. And um, yeah, he's oh. getting ready to travel, so we're hoping we can get him to do that. In private, is private sector vein, if I can help him. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's Specific good. Specific issues to know. you want us to raise. Good. Or whatever. That's good to know. Yeah, you know, the NBA is going to hold their first ever uh, pro game in Africa on August oh, really? 1st, so I'm trying to 
Oh, that Make sure nice. I'm going to be in Kenya with the president, and I'm trying to head oh, over. Oh, wow. Uh, so you're going with POTUS? I'm yeah. going to the summer. Uh, yeah, to the GES. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's excellent. Excellent. Yeah. I don't think, the phone is telling me he's not going, so I'll see whether or not. Yeah, Penny's going. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. She's actually the only, Penny and Linda are the only senior people I've heard of who are, mm-hmm. I know. Linda Thomas Green. Been, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but there, there are people, there are other people from like Steed. Uh, well, the entrepreneur, like. Yeah. Uh, right. The whole GES. How are you? Uh-huh. Hello. Hello. You how pronounce are you? your name Lazier. 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 Yes. Hello. Hello. Nice uh-huh. to see you again. Nice Don to see Gibbs. you. Hi, Don. Yes, nice to see you. Hi. Hello. How are you? you? Sir, Eddie. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jane Harmon, the president and CEO of the Wilson Center, and I do have a good excuse for being a few minutes late. My excuse is that the uh, uh, House Appropriations Bill that funds, uh, that partially funds the Wilson Center is on the House floor. And I was watching C-SPAN to make sure that our funding would be okay. (laughs) And two minutes ago, uh, it became clear that it's okay. So, <laughs> so the lights won't go off. <laughs> exhale. <laughs> exhale. Yeah, the lights won't go off. Certainly not in this room and not uh, on this important occasion. Uh, so my personal thanks to our Wilson cabinet member, Eddie Brown, who's here today. He and his wife, uh, Sylvia, and his colleagues at Brown Capital are very close friends of the Wilson Center. Their support brings our Africa programming to the next level of impact. Thank you, Eddie, and please tell Sylvia she missed a great party. Um, (laughs) Mande Miangwa, uh, our Africa program director, will say more later on what we hope to accomplish together. Stay tuned. Um, I'd also like to recognize Rahama Wright, who sits on the President's Advisory Council on Doing Business in Africa. Uh, Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, One of the most important things uh, the Wilson Center does is push past sound bites, getting nuance in front of policymakers who absolutely need to understand the complexity of issues. (coughs) That's the goal of our conversation on Brand Africa. Too many Americans know too little about the African continent, its diversity, uh, they don't even know how many countries are there, its potential and the ties that bind it to the U.S. We want and we will make the Wilson Center the platform for a smarter conversation. Uh, As all of you know, Congress uh, reauthorized AGOA, the African Growth and Opportunity Act, last month. Uh, It is the backbone of our African trade relationships. Uh, And I'm very proud of the role our Africa program and some of today's guests played in those discussions. And by the way, I was very proud to vote for a GOA when I was a member of Congress. Uh, Assistant U.S. Trade Representative for Africa, Flori Lazier, who is right over there, uh, met here at the center with the African Union's trade ministerial delegation earlier this year. She is a key leader on this issue uh, with the administration, and thank you for all your efforts Thanks to get uh, AGOA reauthorized. In, in April, it was our privilege to uh, welcome the chairperson of the African Union for a conversation on AGOA uh, with Congressman Ed Royce, whom many of you know and who, again, is a close friend here, chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And our experts are always available on the Hill. Uh, I know that uh, Monde enjoyed talking a Goa with uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass from Los Angeles. Um, uh, she was a neighbor in L.A. Our, our congressional districts are very close together. Uh, and she is and will always be, I think, one of the act's chief champions. Uh, one of her staffers is here. Where is Karen Bass's staffer? 
Oh, Margo Sullivan's she's, not here yet. She's not here. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm sure we'll see her shortly. Mm -hmm. We'll build on, uh, today we're building on the efforts we have made, <coughs> we've all made, uh, with respect to AGOA and with respect to these other platforms to teach America about the uh, amazing story of Africa. And we will dig deeper into the misconceptions that make smart engagement challenging. Uh, to kick off the panel today, it is my delight to welcome Mande Miangwa, who is director of our Africa program. Uh, I brag about her all the time and embarrass her. I think I'll restrain myself <laughs> barely today. And the only reason I'm restraining myself is because you all know her. Uh, she will introduce our extremely accomplished speakers and offer some remarks on what this conversation means to the uh, center. So again, thank you, Eddie Brown. Uh, the Brown family and uh, the Brown Enterprise, and please welcome Mande Moyangwa. Thank you, Congresswoman Hellman. I know how busy you are, so I appreciate you taking uh, the time to join us this afternoon. I'm glad to see so many friends of the Africa program and of the Wilson Center present here today. Uh, including members of the African Diplomatic Corps, key staffers from Congress, as well as U.S. government um, officials, and many members of the Africa Focus community from the D.C. area and beyond. Uh, we also have a very strong contingent of Mandela Fellows, all the, from, all the way from Africa. We welcome you, and we look forward to your contributions um, to this discussion on Brand Africa Separating Myth from Reality. Congresswoman already, Harman already spoke about the significance of this event. I don't think that uh, the significance of this topic can be overstated. Why? The bottom line, I would argue, is that the prevailing image of Africa gets in the way of productive and mutually beneficial relations between the U.S. and Africa at many levels. And many, many opportunities are missed. Over the last few years, there has been a lot of talk about the need for the United States and other international partners to recognize the transformation that is taking place in some parts of Africa, in the economic, social, and political fronts, and to engage differently and more constructively with Africa. This desire found its deepest expression in the last year's historic U.S.-Africa Leader Summit, with its focus on expanding and enhancing U.S. trade, investment, and business ties with Africa. Yet I think, as a congresswoman says, the prevailing image for many is that Africa remains a challenging environment for increased international economic and business engagement, mostly because of what many perceive to be a poor or even tarnished brand Africa. Misconceptions and generalizations about Africa abound, especially concerning the governance challenges, the poverty, the disease epidemics. Who can forget Ebola? and how many people in this country viewed what was taking place in three countries and its impact and evaluation of what was going on in the rest of the continent. While one could argue that in some cases this negativity regarding brand Africa is warranted, and we should not shy away from acknowledging those areas in which African countries are not doing well, you could also argue that as currently defined, Brand Africa obscures the key transformation occurring on the continent and results in a situation in which international trade and investments continue to bypass Africa for the most part. So until we unpack and begin to understand what is real and what is myth and how the issues of poor governance, corruption, conflict, etc., play out in Africa, this overly negative and generalized understanding of Brand Africa will continue to shape and inform key aspects of U.S.-Africa relations, as well as U.S. and international corporate decisions regarding trade and investment and engagement with the continent. So let me put a couple of issues up front. We all know that Africa has a branding problem. Some of that is a result of Africa's own actions. Some of it is a result of the international community not caring to find out and understand Africa better. So we need to unpack the key factors that underpin this weak and tarnished brand Africa and begin to have a forward-leaning discussion 
about how best to move forward. What can we do about this brand, both here in the United States and in Africa? So rather than focus on the negative brand Africa and the frustration that those of us who work Africa feel in terms of how Africa is perceived, I hope the vast majority of our discussion today will be spent talking about concrete and positive measures that we can take at both the official and private levels for addressing the factors that negatively impact uh, brand Africa. And to help us understand these issues and to share some recommendations for the way forward, we have four very good speakers, each of whom would speak to, could speak to this issue by themselves. However, we did want to get a variety of perspectives to really enrich our discussion today. And before I introduce our speakers, a quick word about the rules of engagement. We have four speakers. Each of them will speak for eight minutes from a specific angle that we've asked them to address. Once the speakers have spoken, we will have a moderated period in which I'll ask the speakers a few questions. And following that, we'll have a period of Q&A between you, the participants, and the speakers. I will then summarize the key points and invite Mr. Brown to say a few words, and we will conclude at 5 p.m., and then we'll have a mix and mingle from 5 to 5.30, during which we can continue the discussion. If that's an acceptable way to proceed, let me now introduce our distinguished speakers, and I'll introduce them in the order in which they will speak. Our first speaker is Mr. Omoyele Shawore, who is the founder and CEO of Sahara Reporters. I think we all have a view on how the international media views Africa, and I thought it would be important for us to get a view from the African side, how Africa sees, the African media sees brand Africa, and how it sees the international media playing and contributing to this image of brand Africa. So Shawori, you have eight minutes, my friend. The <laughs> clock is ticking. <laughs> it's over to you. Here today, I I have uh, two little problems uh, regarding to this uh, event. One is that um, I work in the media sector, and uh, the way Africa is portrayed today is uh, as a result of the way media internationally has handled Africa for several years. Secondly, I have a problem with uh, the word branding itself. Uh, Considering that I come from a country uh, known as Nigeria that has failed to rebrand itself uh, almost three times. Uh, they had a project called Rebranding, spend uh, millions of dollars on it, including coming to D.C. and other parts of the world to portray Nigeria uh, in a different light other than the reality on the ground. And that effort failed so much that uh, the word branding scares me. Uh, <laughs> but it's very important to go into the issues and uh, say this, that um, what has happened to Africa over the years uh, is one major thing that I was thinking about as I was coming here. It's the fact that Africa is the only continent that uh, not only have resources, but it's treated as a commodity, you know. And when you have a continent treated as a commodity, you can reduce it to anything, including try to brand it. Otherwise, I have never heard anywhere before that uh, the United States of America is a brand. It's known as a country, and it's known uh, as a continent. Africa is also a continent. But I am not saying that to uh, blame those who make this happen, just to give you an idea of where I'm coming from and where Africa is coming from. And I've worked myself, uh, why, uh, partly the reason why I feel like uh, uh, I'm in the wrong place today, is to actually expose some of the things that uh, make Africa look bad, which is putting the feet of African leaders to fire uh, using a platform that we created nine years ago. Uh, well, of course, internet media, which is uh, new media. But the good news also uh, is that uh, young people in Africa are waking up. They are waking up to a bunch of uh, realities, and those realities uh, begin to bust the myth about Africa. Uh, today, Nigeria has over 100 million uh, mobile phone users. There are more mobile phone users in Nigeria than you have in Canada. 
and they are using it to enhance their lives in ways that even the Nigerian government cannot catch up with Nigerian youth. Uh, if you go to Kenya today, uh, it has become an innovation hub where people are producing uh, all kinds of softwares that you probably have never heard about before to deal with their daily realities. Uh, things as simple as uh, uh, even looking for where to buy pizza in the U.S., you can get uh, a Kenyan software known as Ushahidi to locate where to find pizza. And that's something to be proud of and proud about, uh, about Africa. But again, all of this leads us to a challenge and a reality which we cannot stop talking about, that Africa needs to uh, step over one of its biggest challenges, which is leadership. Uh, and this brings me back to where I started, which is how Africa is being seen, because Africa has 54 countries. If we were to be the U.S., it means it has four more states higher than the United States of uh, America. And the reality is that not all of those 54 states are doing well, you know. Only about 10, if you want to be generous, uh, countries are doing well in Africa. And because Africa is what it is, uh, the international media has found Africa to be a place where they do target practice, you know. And by saying that they do target practice, I'm not trying to blame them uh, for doing it. I blame African leaders for also creating an environment for uh, those kind of things. And what happens is that one day I sat down as I was working uh, on reports on Africa, and I started looking at the international media representation on the continent of Africa and found out that New York Times only has one reporter covering the entire sub-Sahara African region. That means this very, very clairvoyant guy sits down in a hotel uh, in Ivory Coast, and he's somehow able to look at a crystal ball and know what is happening in Ivory Coast, Ghana, Nigeria, and Senegal, and sends in reports. And those reports are believed immediately uh, from a guy who never left his hotel room most of the time. If he wants to be generous, he will hire two other guys uh, who are known as stringers. Uh, and the stringers will also hire some other guys that takes them to some neighborhoods to get you the news that you have here. But Again, the good news is that Africans are taking some of those narratives uh, into their own hands. Uh, we have uh, been around for only nine years, SaharaReporters.com, and now we have become a full multimedia uh, platform that has uh, a TV online and also an FM radio in addition to our website. We have some 1.6 million likes on Facebook, about 600,000 people following us on Twitter. And they are organically reacting and interacting with messages that we put out every day. Uh, do, can I tell you that our messages are always nice? No. Uh, but we have been able to bring into the African narrative a particularly interesting uh, uh, part, which is that you know, there are now Africans are now playing with African news. So when I used New York Times, for example, as uh, an example of how to be far and close, you look at it, if they write news in, about Africa, it's probably 500 words. You know, if you get to see two of that in a week, one of them will be about, you know, a witchcraft somewhere killing somebody, and the other one will be another, you know, African government that has just rigged the election, which they do all the time. Uh, but the question I ask myself is, the New York Times is naturally for the people in New York City. You know, that's how I understand it. Uh, it's not for Africa. You can't find a fresh newspaper called New York Times on the streets of Africa. And nobody's selling it because it's New York Times. Uh, so the African perspective is not there. It's not a story written about, by Africans. And one of the things I put upon myself is to say, well, if you're going to write bad things about Africa, let it come from Africans. And let Africans discuss these issues. And let it ginger Africans to do what is right for Africa. One of the things I love about what new media has brought to Africa is that it has helped us to shame Africa, shame ourselves, and force ourselves to discuss the reality about Africa and to also bust the myth about Africa because we can compete with the news. We can interact 
with ourselves. And these interactions has produced for Africa not any kind of commodity, but a more solid Africa in terms of how Africans are confronting their own issues. And that is why we have seen in Africa, which hasn't happened in a long time, some kind of even revolutions. We've seen in Africa some form of progress. Now, if you go to Lagos and you want to book hotel, you don't need Expedia. There's hotel.ng in Nigeria, where you can get hotels the same way you get and pay in Nigerian local currency without having to scratch your head up. We now have even Nigerian credit cards for the first time have been accepted all over the world. This wasn't done by Nigerian government, by the way. It was done by creative Nigerian young people who have taken the tools that I have been asked to talk about in eight minutes uh, to change a little bit of the narrative. But I think as we start to look at these conversations, which happens not in these small rooms anymore, but in the cyberspace, we need to drop certain languages too. I do not want Africa to be a brand. I want it to be seen as a continent. I want it to be treated as a continent. I want the people of Africa to be given the same dignity that is afforded every other continent, every other country around the world, so that we do not leave Africa in the hands of PR agents and brand managers, but real leaders and real people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shaori. A lot to chew on there, and I'm sure you have um, provided us with a number of lines on which we can follow during the Q&A. Uh, let me now introduce um, next speaker and a good friend of the Wilson Center and the Africa Program, um, Honorable Florizel Lizier, who is the Assistant U.S. Trade Representative for Africa in the Office of the United States Trade Representative. And she really just did yeoman's work on AGOA, and we thank you for your efforts on that front. And you're going to talk to us about some of the um, perspectives about how AGOA and beyond fits into brand Africa and what we might be able to do differently in terms of engaging in that sphere. So the floor is yours. Great. So first of all, thank you, Mundi, and to the Wilson Center for your commitment um, to having people come here to discuss how the U.S. can improve its economic engagement with uh, our African partners, that dialogue uh, has been important um, and one that um, uh, we appreciate. Uh, we also know that there are many uh, stakeholders, uh, some here today, um, and, um, and, and many in the private sector, civil society, who spent a lot of time and effort working with us in the administration, as well as with members of Congress to get um, uh, the African Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA, uh, extended. And so I want to, on behalf of the administration, thank all of you for your work and your commitment um, to that program and to um, sending a signal, we're talking about branding Africa, sending a signal to uh, our African partners, to producers and manufacturers of, 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 of goods in Africa, to U.S. buyers and to investors from all over the world, uh, including uh, in Africa and certainly here in the U.S., that uh, Africa is open for business. It's been open for business, but that um, by extending AGOA for uh, 10 years, we have provided certainty now um, for those who want to operate in that space and take advantage of the duty-free access to the U.S. market for African products that AGOA provides. So again, we in the administration are really pleased that the Trade Preferences Extension Act of 2015, which was signed by President Obama on June 29th, um, we are excited about its passage. Uh, as I said, it extends AGOA for an additional 10 years. Um, uh, until September 30th of 2025. And um, it means that uh, this extension, which is the longest in the history of the program, 
um, will provide that certainty. And we think that that certainty for producers in Africa, for the buyers here in the U.S., for the investment community around the world, is also going to contribute to positive branding of Africa. It means that uh, people who are looking to expand their sourcing will look to Africa. It means that those who are building regional and global value chains in various products will uh, look to Africa. They know that now um, uh, they can uh, look to get inputs and final products from the Africans uh, at, at uh, duty-free prices, obviously, and that that will mean they can support their businesses and the trade that they are promoting uh, more effectively by partnering uh, with Africa. Um, I think many of you know that um, uh, U.S. companies have been in Africa for some time, um, uh, some uh, for uh, 50 years and more. Um, so even though there is a hesitancy, even though there are uh, uh, perceptions of Africa and the continent, many people thinking of Africa as a country instead of a continent of 54 countries, um, we also know that whatever the perceptions have been and continue to be today, there are U.S. businesses that are actively on the ground uh, in Africa, have been, and are making their plans for the future uh, based on um, uh, having Africa be a major market for them. Um, uh, I think many of you know that in terms of trade under AGOA, um, we've certainly used the uh, program and its eligibility criteria to promote that environment, that sense for our businesses that uh, Africa uh, was certainly a place to develop joint partnerships, um, joint ventures with, and that has happened. Trade has also increased. Um, uh, in 2014, U.S. total trade, including our exports and imports, with Sub-Saharan Africa totaled $56.7 billion, and that's more than double uh, the trade that we had with them in 2001, which was the first full year of AGOA. And non-oil trade was $4.4 billion in 2014, which is over three times the amount of non-oil trade in 2001. And several non-oil sectors, even though oil still dominates, um, oil's uh, place in U.S.-Africa trade has uh, diminished, and a number of non-oil sectors have expanded considerably since AGOA's incep uh, inception, including vehicles and parts, uh, cocoa powder and cocoa paste, apparel, footwear, um, and a number of other sectors. So we know that um, that's happening. Trade is increasing. We know that investment is increasing. There have been recent reports about uh, Africa Greenfield uh, investment uh, being on the rise, including from U.S. Uh, uh, partners and investors. Um, and we know that the macroeconomic conditions uh, in Africa have improved, and in many places, not all over the continent, but in many places are stable and so what we're seeing is increased growth, increased stability, um, and uh, uh, an interest in U.S. businesses in trying to capture uh, that market and take advantage of Africa's stability, as well as some of the uh, trends in uh, new leadership and also in doing business there. There have been increases and improvements in how uh, Africa is doing business with the world. And they are, as I said, opening their markets, putting in place policies and reforms that make it easier for uh, companies to operate and also makes them more attractive to uh, investors. In fact, the World Bank's uh, ease of doing business indicators show that a number of the sub-Saharan African countries have substantially streamlined their regulatory procedures, they've shortened their timelines for starting a business, and uh, this is all uh, good news, um, good branding uh, for Africa. Um, now, having said that, um, we know that there is still um, a lot of work that needs to be done, that many African nations 
need to continue to make reforms that will allow them to benefit from the global trading system, to increase trade amongst the African countries moving goods across their own borders, um, and attract the volume and the type of investment that they need in order to support sustainable and transformative growth uh, on the continent. The World uh, Economic Forum's latest global competitiveness report shows that there are large regional variations in competitiveness in Sub-Saharan Africa and advises that to achieve sustained and inclusive growth will require significant investment in infrastructure and workforce skills. Um, so what does this all mean in terms of Brand Africa and the perception of the re region as a place to do business? Um, I think that more and more U.S. companies have become aware of the opportunities that Africa offers, and they also recognize that there are challenges and risk, but that the rewards are high. I think the highest level of uh, return on investment um, is for Africa, is in Africa, as opposed to other regions of the world. Um, so even though uh, we know that it's uh, difficult, especially for smaller companies, um, and those with little exposure in Africa uh, to um, uh, get a foothold in the market. We also know that um, there are a range of, of, of U.S. businesses across a wide number of sectors that are there, others that are looking to be there. We know that through our Doing Business in Africa program that uh, small businesses are um, uh, also doing business with uh, Africans. And so from the U.S. point of view, um, whether it's uh, the State Department or Commerce, um, the Department of Agriculture, um, our Overseas Private Investment Corporation, Exim Bank, um, or the Trade and Development Agency, um, we are all working together uh, collectively to try to support both our own businesses as well as uh, uh, engaging with African uh, government officials and African entrepreneurs uh, to help them take advantage of programs like AGOA uh, specifically and more generally to enhance the U.S.-Africa trade and investment um, relationship. So we're going to use all the tools that we have, uh, those that are available to us, um, including trade capacity building, advice on uh, a go utilization strategies that's in the uh, new legislation and engagement more generally on trade and investment policy reform to continue to deepen uh, the U.S. Africa trade and investment relationship and to take advantage of the new brand Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lizer. Let me now turn to Ambassador Donald Gibbs who is a senior counselor with Albright um, Stonebridge and a very good friend of the Africa program. Uh, he was one of the first people I met when I joined the Africa program and was absolutely um, incredibly supportive on um, getting the Africa program uh, going again. So thank you very much. I'm glad you're here. Uh, he also serves as chair of the U.S. South Africa Business Council, and he previously served as the United States Ambassador to South Africa from 2009 to 2013. So given this background, I thought I'd put him on the spot and ask him to share with us his thoughts on um, how security, economic, and political governance play into brand Africa and how that impacts U.S. corporate engagement with the continent. Great. Ambassador Gibbs. Mande, thank you very much. And she's over here keeping me on time, just in case uh, uh, she's got a little signs out. Uh, it's an honor to be here and great to be with these uh, panelists uh, who are so wonderful and articulate in their comments about Africa. You know, when I first uh, got this note from Mande, I actually just had given a talk a little while ago where we took all the covers of The Economist from the last 10 years that talked about Africa. And it told this story of, you know, blight in Africa, black hole, and then rising Africa, and uh, Africa on the right, all those covers. And you can go back and look them up. They're, it's, an, uh, it's an interesting timeline of how the image of Africa has changed. And I agree with my colleague. It, it's not about the brand. It's about the reality. Um, and I think where I come out now on brand Africa is there is no brand Africa, because Africa is 
an incredibly divergent continent right now with 54 countries each going their own way. And I think too often in America we oversimplify and we talk about Africa is one entity. It came home to me, um, I'd gone to uh, the incredible, su incredibly successful African Leadership Summit here that you know, I think the Obama administration deserves great credit for organizing and bringing all these African leaders to Washington. And I'd come out of that and I thought, you know, wow, the story of Africa is getting told. And I went to go visit my son in a university town, highly educated, and I realized I was on a trip. I was about to go to South Africa and I forgot my computer charger. So I went into the uni university bookstore and said, I need to buy a charger for my laptop. I'm heading to Africa. I'm heading to South Africa. And they said, oh, you can't go to Africa. There's Ebola in Africa. You can't <laughs> enter the continent. You know, meanwhile, we had Ebola here in the U.S. Uh, and many African countries did a better job than we did of maintaining, uh, uh, fighting back against Ebola. So it struck me until these stories mature and we're telling the story of South Africa, the story of Nigeria, the story of Ethiopia, each of these are different stories. And I think the biggest barrier for businesses that I work with, including we announced, uh, I do a lot of work with a major U.S. private equity firm, Blackstone, and we announced a $5 billion commitment to the continent of Africa to build power in Africa. And when we looked at how we were going to spend that money, we said these are you know, to spend it in Africa doesn't work. We're either going to spend it in Nigeria or Ethiopia or Kenya, and we have to understand each of those as a country, not as a continent, because in many of those places you have to not understand the country but the state or the province that you're going to do your work in because they're each an individual story. And I think until American understanding of Africa matures to the point where we start to understand those individual stories and the complexities of doing a business in Nigeria versus Ethiopia, two very different stories that need to be told. And it, it can't be about branding. Branding doesn't work. South Africa, the country I am uh, was ambassador in, spends a lot of time on branding, but then when you start having brownouts or strikes or Americana, all that money's wasted. You gotta get the governance right, the rules right to create it. Now having said all that, the biggest single barrier that I see to U many U.S. companies who are looking at going to Africa is the market size. Now a billion people is a big market, that's Africa, but as I just said, it's actually 54 small markets. Nigeria, the biggest economy in Africa, has a GDP something like the state of North Carolina. So we're, we're talking about smaller markets that the biggest single positive step that I think the continent could drive, toward is, drive towards is breaking down the barriers to trade within Africa. And I think you know, the administration's made some efforts around this. The AU is making efforts around this. There's a bunch of conversations around free trade zones. But until that's a reality, until standards are harmonized, until single border crossings are put in place, until roads and highway, highways, rail, and airports are put in place that make Africa truly one market for economic goods, I don't think there is, can, or will be a brand Africa. Th until that happens, I think it's 54 different markets, different sizes, each with their own challenge. Thank you. You didn't touch on the security issue. I you knew you'd come back at me. <laughs> um, look, the security issues, again, are different depending on where you are. You know, I lived in South Africa, which at different points has been the murder capital of the world, yet, you know, if you're doing business in Johannesburg or Cape Town, you know, you're in a fairly protected community because most of the crime is sadly black on black in the townships of South Africa. Um, so it doesn't mean that bad things don't happen and people worry about it, but you know, I felt and still feel very safe when I go there doing business. And as a matter of fact, I, as an ambassador, didn't have a security detail in South Africa. Um, uh, the, um, in 
a place like Nigeria, where I'm now doing a lot of business, you know, the stories are way worse than the reality. I go around Lagos and uh, feel perfectly safe doing so. Now, I'm not going up to the north. I'm not going where Boko Haram is creating problems. And the, the real challenge is the stories of Boko Haram get magnified. And then I've had a number of CEOs, African, the heads of Africa for U.S. companies say to me, my company will not let me go to Nigeria biggest market in Africa, more children being born in Nigeria than all of Europe, and the security officers at these companies are saying, you can't go there because of something that's happening in the north, which probably has very little to do with the actual business that you're going to be doing either in Abuja or Lagos. Uh, so I think the real challenges, and then you have the sadness of something like what's happened in uh, South Sudan. You know, this was a a country that we all celebrated as uh, yeah. a potential great new beginning, and now the civil war is creating untold atrocities. No business will think about going there, and it, it's a real challenge. No, thank you very much, Ambassador Gibbs. I think you, you also raised a number of key issues, which I'm sure we'll be able to uh, delve into uh, during the Q&A. And I, I like that you touched both on the macro-level uh, conflict but also the micro level insecurity as it manifests itself in, in different countries. So thank you very much for that. Uh, our last speaker, but certainly not the least, will be Ms. Valentina Saltani. She is a member of the Doing Business team at the World Bank, a team that she's been on since um, March of 2011. And I know Ms. Lizer referenced the work that they are doing. And I know that uh, <coughs> this report uh, is actually a little bit controversial and uh, many questions about this methodology, but it is the one and only comprehensive report that there is that tries to assess the business and uh, regulatory framework uh, and environment in Africa. And I know that the World Bank over the last two years has also taken measures uh, to actually improve and work on the methodology. So I thought it would be important to have a discussion today about um, the, the, the report um, focusing on an assessment of the business environment in Africa, particularly as it pertains to opportunities for ordinary African citizens to start businesses in their own countries and what's been done there. So, Ms. Valentina, you have eight minutes. Perfect. Thank you very much, Monda. Thank you to the Wilson Center for, this, for giving us this great opportunity to discuss such an important issue and to focus our findings um, on Africa. How do I skip the slide? Do I? It's not in the way of the slides. She's coming. Oh, you have it. I have it here. Right. Thank you. I'll show you some interesting and exciting graphs and encouraging uh, images. So I want to share the slides with you. So basically, uh, what the doing business is about, just to, uh, to give you a very quick introduction uh, about what we actually measure. We focus, as Monda said, only on domestic businesses in, uh, and domestic regulations for small to medium-sized business in 189 economies. And uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa and Middle East are two important regions in the report. Um, the way the World Bank classifies economies, we actually separate North Africa from Sub-Saharan Africa. And the data that I will show you today is mostly based on Sub-Saharan Africa. However, whatever trends are um, shown for that particular region are also relevant, relevant to the North Africa. So uh, again, we don't look at the informal sector. We don't look at the shadow economy. We only look at regulations for uh, domestic, small, and medium-sized firms. Um, Doing business uh, looks at 12 different indicator sets because we want to give as rounded, as well-rounded picture of um, firm life cycle in any country as possible. So we look at areas such as starting a business, uh, paying taxes, trading across borders, obtaining a construction permit, registering property, getting credit, uh, bankruptcy proceedings, and so forth. Now, why is it so important? We do, we do a lot of analysis in-house, and we show that countries that have favorable environment for domestic firms to do business also fare well on a lot of macroeconomic indicators. They have smaller informal economy, they have higher GDP growth, they have higher employment creation rates. So therefore, it's important to study uh, the business climate for domestic firms across the world. 
Speaking specifically to about Africa, let me take you back 10 years and to show you what was happening on the continent back then in terms of the doing business indicators. So you see that in 2005, it was very difficult to start a business in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. It was very costly. There were high minimum capital requirements. <laughs> Procedures took a lot of time. There were a lot of bureaucratic obstacles that um, f uh, faced by entrepreneurs that wanted to engage in their own business activities. Now if we look at taxes, again we see that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa had extremely high total tax rates. If we look at only eight Sub-Saharan African economies, we see that on average they paid more than 80% in profits uh, in, in taxes during that time, which of course is prohibitive to their business development and growth. Now on the registering property indicator, again property Property transfers were extremely costly, took a lot of time, especially if we comp uh, compare Sub-Saharan Africa to, to the other economies around the world. And when it comes to court systems, uh, strength of legal institutions, in four out of five most expensive ec uh, economies to, um, uh, to, to resolve a commercial dispute, four of them were found in Sub-Saharan Africa. And basically to resolve a dispute costs so much, it cost 146% uh, of the disputed claim, so basically it took incentives away from people uh, from going to courts. So people didn't go to courts to, resol to resolve the, their problems, they saw courts as adding to their existing problems. But what has been happening over time? Africa is an incredible continent, it's very vibrant, there is a lot of appetite for reform, there is a lot of appetite to improve things, to, Im to make business climate better for small and medium sized businesses. For example, when the project started back in 2003-2004, there was a lot, uh, very little engagement between us and the governments of uh, African economies. Now every year up to 40 governments reach out to us asking us to count their reforms asking for examples of best practices, asking for us to comment on what else can be done to make business climate more favorable for the local entrepreneurs. Back in 2005 in Sub-Saharan Africa, there were only three economies where to open up a business took less than 20 days. And now 27 out of uh, 47 economies in Sub-Saharan Africa reached that, tar uh, that target. We noticed that many, many countries in the region opened up one-stop shops. And here I want to, to mention that very often when people think about Africa, they say, well, but the technology is still not very uh, highly developed compared especially to rich economies. There is so much uh, people there can do, which is not true because a lot of countries that didn't have resources, they still managed to improve uh, business climate through developing physical one-stop shops, through revising their laws and regulations. So there are many ways that African leaders are trying to use to improve the business climate and that yields uh, very encouraging results. I really like this image because it shows that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is the second region in the world with the highest number of reforms um, aimed at improving business climate for a local business um, between 2013 and 2014. And uh, if we compare again to what was happening in 2005-2006, uh, then only 33% uh, of Sub-Saharan African economies implemented reforms compared to 74% now. So again, it's not a stagnant region, things are happening, and unfortunately like through the media we sometimes focus more like on negatives rather than positives, but we forget to acknowledge all the impressive efforts that took place on the ground. Every year we measure uh, global top improvers. So basically we look at 10 economies that improve their business climate on these 12 indicators that we measure the most. And last year was a very exciting year for us because five of these economies were from Sub-Saharan Africa. Benin, Togo, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, which means these economies put in a tremendous amount of efforts into improving uh, indicators that help businesses to actually get access to credit, um, enforce their contracts, go through bankruptcy proceedings quickly and efficiently. So we saw a lot of uh, positive improvement on the ground. Um, also, these graphs I find they're very, very interesting because they show the averages for the countries in Sub-Saharan uh, sub Africa compared to the rest of the world. And over the years, we've been seeing this consistent trend where, sub uh, where African economies are trying to align themselves with the more developed world. So they're redu reducing the time to start a business, they're reducing costs of doing business, they're reducing the total tax rate, making tax payments more efficient. A lot of countries are introducing electronic systems that facilitate um, 
uh, tax revenue collection that can be then reinvested in the greater good in the economy. Um, the time to register property has also been going down. And this is the trend that we see on a lot of indicators that are captured by the doing business. Um, here, this graph, that 100% line basically shows the best practice frontier. Where it's an ideal situation where everything goes perfectly, courts are running well, their regulations are smooth, transparent, and efficient. And the lines basically show how much countries in sub-Saharan Africa advance towards the best practice frontier. Again, you see the region is vibrant. Some countries are advancing more than the others, but again, we cannot generalize because a lot of countries showed remarkable progress on, uh, on our indicators over time. And finally, to, to conclude, the, uh, most of the African uh, countries were not significantly affected by the financial crisis, so that didn't impede their, um, their, uh, their, the pace of their reforms. And the upward movement continues throughout the years. We're very curious. We collected two more years of data to see uh, how the trend behaved over the past two years. But there's this always upward movement uh, towards the best practice frontier. And Africa is actually catching up with the other continents, with the other regions of the world in terms of best practices. So we hope this trend goes, um, goes in the same uh, progression as before. And uh, again, it's very encouraging to see such great results in the con on the continent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valentina. I thought that was very, very useful because it helps us to understand what's happening in individual African countries and also how Africa compares to um, the rest of the world in terms of what it's uh, doing. So thank you very much. Seeing as we have a really packed house today, and I know you all have a lot to say on this topic, I'm going to bypass my uh, session where I was going to have a discussion with the participants, with the speakers, sorry, and just open it up. But there are going to be some rules for engagement. So we want to benefit from everybody's contribution during this session. So I'm going to ask that uh, you raise your hands. And once you have been acknowledged, we'll bring a mic to you. You have one minute in which to ask your question or make your comment. But before you do that, please identify yourself by name, the organization with which you're affiliated, and the speaker to whom you're directing the question. And please limit yourself to one question. I have a couple of red cards in here. <laughs> you don't want to see one of those. All right, so we will open up um, the discussion, the Q&A session. So questions. I'll take the gentleman in the back over there and comments. Uh. Thank you very much. My name is Nyaka Lagoke. I represent the Revival of Pan-Africanism Forum. I came here to support Sore, but I come here often. And I just want to make a brief comment. And um, it's about uh, uh, the contribution of uh, the Ambassador Gibbs. And I particularly liked uh, what you said about the necessity for unity and greater regional integration in Africa, and I love it because I believe in Pan-Africanism. So when we talk about that, people see us as radicals. Coming from an American ambassador, I'm really thrilled, and I just want to thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Thank you. All right. I, I wish I could take credit for that, but that idea actually came in the first time I met Secretary Clinton uh, when she was Secretary of State. She she said to me she thought this was the key thing for Africa, was figuring out how to create true regional integration. Thank you very much. Okay. Questions, comments? I'll take the lady in the back over there. Thank you very much. Emmy Simmons from the Partnership to Cut Hunger and Poverty in Africa. And this is a question for Mr. Shawari, because you basically kind of said not a good idea to think about that concept of brand Africa. But I wondered what you thought of sort of the utility of the challenge that a term like brand Africa puts out there and the sort of giving, giving countries the kind of peer group pressure to be part of that group which our, our last speaker noted as those who are moving ahead, those who are making a difference, those who are actually changing the way the business is done. So I wondered, you know, whether in fact there's a positive side to really pursuing a brand Africa and what you might think of that. 
you know, the reason why I said uh, I didn't want to be part of any of these uh, lingos is that uh, Africa, honestly, is the only continent in the world where the people who are most popular, respected, are non-Africans. Uh, if you go to Africa today, if you want to talk about Africa, uh, probably Bono is more respected than any African leader in the world. And they come from this idea that you can throw at the continent of Africa some lingos whenever you like and have people just follow you like that. You know, there used to be times to say, you know, Africa rising, you know. Uh, sorry. There was a time um, that Africa as an entire continent, right, was, you know, put out there as a place that is open for business, and I'm not doing that to challenge people who are saying it. Africa has always been treated as a marketplace. You know, it is from Africa that human beings were first purchased and taken to other parts of the world. So how can a country, continent more open, be more open for business than you go and purchase human beings and take them away? <laughs> you go and purchase gold, you take it away. You go and purchase copper, you take it away. You go and purchase everything you can imagine in this world. They go there and purchase in Africa. No matter how, and I'm glad that uh, the, the U.S. Uh, rep here said it, that Africa has the highest return on investment. That is, you can just be broke, go to Africa, and you'll be back rich. That's the way Africa is, you know. But the, the, the question is, couldn't Africa be doing so well such that it is not taken as a commodity every time we want to treat Africa? That Africa is treated equally like the rest of the world. Look at Greece. If what happened in Greece two days ago had happened in Africa, you would have heard about the overthrow of an African president. But everybody is praising Greece for bailing out of the economic policy that is enslaving. But you all know that the home of structural adjustment program was, you know, Africa. The World Bank, the IMF, they went to Africa and practiced structural, and they came back and said they failed. Nobody apologized for it. It was treated as a brand at that time. SAP, structural adjustment, tighten your belt, everything. I was an activist. I became an activist fighting against the World Bank and the economic policies that pauperized Nigerians and Africa. And it is the reason, some of this economic policy, that Africa became a place of war, famine, and poverty. It's because Africa has been treated as a brand all the time. And whenever Africa has another problem, we put out another word or another lingo. And we wonder, that's, that's what I'm objecting against. I'm not objecting against people who want to help Africa. But I'm always saying that, look, Africa can help itself. Because if you look at the investment that goes into Africa every year, have, has anybody ever looked at how much is taken out of Africa, just one country out of Africa, in this direction? And not just the supportive, you know, kind of NGO, you know, kind of I want to feel good, you know, or anybody who has, who has a divorce issue goes to Africa to go and see African, you know, elephants and they come back. You know, I mean, or you go and buy a baby in Africa. That's the kind of branding that I don't like. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, you, you have your very interesting ways of framing things, and I absolutely love that you're so direct and to the point. But I think one of the issues we're dancing around here, and you've sort of talked about it, uh, one of the issues we're dancing around here is this whole issue of governance. Okay? We're dancing around the whole issue of corruption. And I, I think we should not shy away from it. So it would be really interesting to see in terms of this whole governance issue. And by the way, African leaders also have culpability in some of the issues that Absolutely. you're talking about. Yep. And so if we're really going to have a discussion about that, we need to unpack that as well. I'm not just saying it's a, it's a, it's a one-way street. So let's talk a little bit about how this corruption issue feeds into this brand African, what's real and what's not. I mean, this, this reality to corruption in Africa, and the reason why it's a problem is that <clears throat> there's so little in Africa that you cannot afford to just steal everything. And we unfortunately have some really bad gluttonous, kleptomaniac leaders out of Africa who are ripping and ripping Africa. <coughs> but one of the things I'll tell you is that they do not carry out any of this corruption without a corresponding act of support or connivance 
between them and Western banks. You know, at some of the most corrupt places or people in the world are based on Wall Street. You know, they could steal all of Africa budget overnight and gamble with it. But you see, we're not talking about them. We're talking about our own leaders who have responsibility not to steal what should have gone into education routes. It took me eight hours, two months ago, to travel between Accra, Ghana, and Lagos. What was it? Another brand of corruption, because everybody's looking for coins, you know, in Benin. You know, and the corruption grows until you get into Nigeria. You see the, what they call mega corruption. Because, you know, in Benin, they want just a little bit of coin. Nigeria, they want to collect your car, you know, if they can. <laughs> but it fits into, you know, the negativity of how it is. But it's also the reality. And that's the reason why I'm happy to tell you that I'm one of the people capable about reporting all of this. But the truth is that we are forcing Africans to discuss these issues. I was at the inauguration of President Buhari in Abuja, which is the first time I've ever legally entered Nigeria in eight years. And my happiest moment was being with Mugabe and asking him, when are you stepping down? Because, <laughs> you know, you can't just be in Zimbabwe for the rest of you. It doesn't matter how good you were. You're no longer useful. When are you leaving, sir? <laughs> and many people weren't happy about it, but that question alone got Zimbabweans talking about it, that it took them a week discussing it, and they had fired their Minister of Information for the way they handled it. Their Vice President had to go to the Parliament and claim that we apologized to Mugabe, which we didn't. But, but it's because of the level of conversation and interaction that is happening from the kind of new media that is also taking place in Africa, that people are able to question things without really being afraid uh, of getting killed. It doesn't mean that they won't kill you, but there's just too many people to kill now <laughs> that people are being empowered in a different way. I just wanted to add, uh, first of all, if you haven't seen the video that you guys did, go on YouTube and look at it. It's amazing with Mugabe at the election. It's uh, incredibly well done. Uh, second, you know, I know that there's a bunch of the Mandela, Mandela fellows in the room, and I think this leadership issue, which we're all talking about, you guys are the answer. Um, and I, it's the young people of Africa with the tools of social media. They're going to force, well, first of all, hopefully some of you will rise to leadership and help drive your countries. But even those of you who don't, you are the voices that are going to change the course of Africa. I mean, you only look at this election in Nigeria, which mm -hmm. You could have take, taken bets uh, around the world on, was this going to be a peaceful election that would lead to Buhari becoming president? You could have made a lot of money betting on the result that happened, which was peaceful largely, largely well done. And it was the role of civil society uh, and the role of social media that helped create that. Um, and I think that's part of the future of the continent. Thank you. Valentino? Yeah, and First, a remark that uh, very often uh, people who that think about Africa, they think about corruption, which is not true because, as we know, who, all the people who watch the news, corruption is not only an African phenomena. It's, uh, it happens in many countries of the world. So I personally don't like that stigma that Africa equals corruption. This is just a complete uh, misstatement. However, what we see from our data, what's true is that in Af African economies, most of them have very weak, weak um, legal institutions and m a lot of reforms that I talk about that Africa is taken up those are more focused on um, facilitating bureaucratic delays you know ir eliminating procedures but the reforms that actually take place on legal indicators are very slow they take a lot of time and the percentage is very low if, you, if we separate these reforms into reforms that focus on bureaucracy such as starting a business registering property taxes versus l reforms that deal with courts with litigation with bankruptcies uh, we look at 73 uh, percent to 27 percent um, and uh, in, in about a month, we'll be launching a new project that's called Citizen Engagement and Rulemaking, where we look at different regions around the world to see how citizens are engaged and actually in rulemaking processes. <coughs> and uh, we see that in Africa, in many countries, citizens are informed, but by the time they're informed, it's a bit it's already too late. So basically the laws are being drafted, some people are consulted but not everybody, not all the stakeholders have a say in the new legislation and then when rules are enacted then people realize oh well but they're not working so well for the business community because the business community was never involved in designing those rules and regulations.
And, and just on that point, I think to um, give a little bit more information to the point that you just made, Valentina, I was just looking at the Transparency International's 2014 uh, Corruption Percep uh, Perception Index. And on that index, <coughs> for example, um, the United States is ranked number 17th. I mean, that's a fairly good uh, ranking. But you also have a number of African countries that are in the top 50. So again, this is one of those issues, and I think your point about being careful not to paint the entire African continent as, as corrupt, I think, is an important one. But what, what you will find, and I think the second point that you made is, is a key one, uh, corruption is not an African disease, it's a global disease. Uh, but where Africa falls short is in its uh, mechanisms to enforce and police and punish uh, the corruption. And so I think that is an important point uh, to make, that we need to unpack that uh, variable as well. Any other questions, comments? I'll take the gentleman over there, and then I'll go to the gentleman in the back. My name is Dane Erickson. I work with MOBA International. We advise clients throughout the continent. And my wife, um, for a couple of years, was one of those journalists based in Nairobi covering the entire continent. And I wanted to ask a question um, about media coverage. I think there is such a thing as reality, and then there is such a thing as perception. Um, but as media is changing, the industry media is changing so much where there's less and less money, um, and so news organizations can't afford to spend as much money sending reporters throughout the continent, what's, what's the solution? And the issue of uh, Ebola and people thinking, oh, you're going to see South Africa, that's very dangerous, and there are some basic perception challenges that the general public, I think, in the West has about Africa that is, you know, for people working in Africa is so hard to overcome. And yet, it seems as though on the continent, the rise of social media and other things, um, you get a younger population that has more access to information, is more empowered because of the fragmentation of media. But then in international circles, and I think then it, flow, it spills over into policy circles where there, that we just have a massive problem about basic aspects of this vast and diverse continent. So what, you know, what is the solution to that working back here at home in policy circles? Thank you. Sure, I want to tackle that one. Uh, well, I, I, I just want to, this, this, I mean, there's a global media problem, and this is uh, what is, I mean, there's a lot of content out there without context. And, and the U.S. media is the biggest culprit of, of this. Uh, I don't know the last time you watched TV and you heard anything sensible here. And if you're not hearing things that are sensible about your country, what do you expect them to do about other countries that they, care, they don't care about? Everybody is just putting together programming that is attractive to numb people, you know. And I've lived in the U.S. for 16 years, uh, going to 17. And people ask me, why are the people in this country ignorant about Africa? And I said, no, they're not ignorant about Africa. They are ignorant about their own country as well. A lot of people don't know what is going on in this country. That's the reality. And the media is responsible for it. The media is numbing you. Television is killing you. Uh, and there is more internet, there is more you know, uh, telephony in this country, mobile assets. But people are not looking for the right kind of content that will promote their knowledge about the world, or that will promote their knowledge about their neighborhood, or that will even promote their knowledge about their country. And that is one solution that we all have to find at another conference uh, in the future. But honestly, I, I think the solution that of what you're asking for is what people are doing. You know, you create smaller interactive media here and there because the barrier to entry into the business of media is very low now. That's why someone like me who studied geography and planning has become a media practitioner uh, pushing out stories there. So it's very important that people are encouraged to share information and use the information they have, interact with them in a way that can empower them more. And the word to use for it is crowdsourcing a lot. Yeah. I think, Shara, one of the points that has been uh, talked about quite a bit has to do with um, the lack of training of African media, especially in the traditional space. Uh, would you agree with that assessment that because of this lack of the size 
uh, training issues that they're not able to offer a counter narrative that is as compelling. Uh, would you agree with that assessment or do you have a different take on that? I have a different take. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is what, what, ha what happened to the journalists that are trained? Mm -hmm. They are doing nonsense. Uh, and who's going to train them? Except we want to have this superposition of this whole Western concept of what is journalism. And it's okay until we have you know, a bunch of CNN reporters go train Nigerian reporters, then they can't provide it. What are they going to train them about? They're going to train them about the same thing that you see here that you don't like. So I think this is something that has to come internally from Africans themselves to say, look, you know, we want to create our own media. There's no reason, and this has always been my position, there's no reason why Africa cannot produce something that everybody wants to, you know, uh, emulate. There's no reason where we cannot have the media that the whole world is jealous or envious about, not to always say that, well, you know, we have not been trained enough. And like I said at the last conference, you find African ambassadors always say, no, we need more time for democracy. But they, f they drive the finest cars. They don't have a problem operating a Mercedes Benz or a private jet, but they have a problem operating Western democracy. But they don't have a problem with any other thing Western, including Western's Western way of stealing, mm -hmm. you know? So this is, this is just, the thing we must accept as Africans. Let's take responsibility for everything we want to have about Africa. And that should be our brand. It should not be that we have been told all the time how to do things. It's, we've just been around for so long. We must do things that is unique. Okay. And we are unique people. There's no reason why we should just be helpless. Okay. Thank you. There was a question in the back. I'll, I'll swing around this way. Let me take the gentleman, right, you sir. And then I'll take the gentleman right in front of you. Um, hi, Bennett Collins, University of St. Andrews. Um, this is more of a comment for Sawari, but I mean, I think you kind of hit it head on. It's, it's not about the brand. I mean, our generation, millennials, as the you know, older generations like to call us, we're, we're, we've been branded to death. Yes. And we're critical of everything now. We're kind of, as um, a political analyst who's been following the U.S. elections has told me, we're the reality show. Uh, generation. We don't believe anything that's put in, in front of us anymore. So naturally, we were more inclined to find a guy who has bad head every day whenever he comes on Bernie Sanders um, to, <laughs> to be uh, more attractive to us simply because he's more straightforward talking and authentic. So when you say, how about we stop having CNN come over to us and training us? And having other, you know, Western-based organizations, countries, development organizations come over and train you. We're not doing so with authentic faces on. We're doing so with a brand on. The U.S. has branded it itself very well. So, yeah, I agree with you. Africa could be different by just simply being authentic. And I think you're right, Ambassador Gibbs. It is up to millennials to to make that a reality. And that's uh, in our hands right now. So, yeah, I agree. Thanks. Thank Would you, you pass the mic to the gentleman right in front of you, sir? The gentleman in front of you. Thank you very much. I'm Israel Tababu. I'm one of the Monday Washington Fellows, um, and I specifically work on extractive industries, human rights issues. Um, my main concern is as, as a youth volunteer, and Africa has a very wide democrat de demographic base uh, where 65% or more are youth. Uh, so in, in that scenario, what, are, what is the role of um, multinationals in engaging the youth, uh, whether it's uh, through um, stopping illicit capital flight, uh, creating cross-boundary trade among the uh, many start startup, new startups we have in Africa, and then also including them in many of the indicators we use to assess uh, the same. Thank you very much. Let me start with Ambassador Gibson, and then I'll come to you. Pedro, do you want to start? Oh, well, um, <coughs> you know, I think there, it's a very important question about, and I'll to put a slightly different uh, slant on it, which is it's a global question now about how do you create inclusive growth? Because too much of the job, too much of the economic growth that's happening in Africa, but also in the United States, is not job creating, um, and it's more stark in Africa, and I think companies need to figure out how we're going to invest in a way that creates inclusive growth that supports the communities, 
because that's actually the only way you're going to get a long-term return on the investment that you're making. And, you know, in the work I do advising companies, part of what we say is, look, if you're going to Africa for a quick return on your investment, you're going to the wrong place. If you want to go to Africa and invest for the long term, grow with the continent, train people, become a part of the, the countries that you're working in, then you can have long-term success and profitability. And I think that attitude and how you go about it is critical. I also think it's incumbent on governments to demand that of companies that are coming in. And it's, it's not just American companies, it's Chinese companies. India just surpassed the United States in terms of trade with Africa this year. Um, so it's across the range of com countries and companies that are coming to invest, governments and young leaders like yourself need to demand that of the companies that are coming in. The smarter companies will get it. It's in their own term, long-term self-interest. Yes, and um, well, first of all, in terms of like multinational organizations, what can they do? I think they can help, but they shouldn't be considered that that's the solution to the problem, right? Because um, in the World Bank, there are many training programs where people from the World Bank go and work with youth in Africa, and then there's uh, different exchanges. But I think it's more like up to countries and uh, the youth in those countries to take a, uh, advantage of the new opportunities. Because for example, how many Africans come to study in the United States and how many go back? Uh, those that get jobs here, those that get settled, the vast majority uh, stay here, right? So that's one e problem is the, the brain drain. So there, there need to be incentives set in place for people to come back, either it's scholarships or job opportunities. Why I specifically work in the area of starting a business, why do we fight for a simple Entr entry, like low entry barriers for businesses. Why do we fight for low minimum capital requirement? Because if, when you're young, when you don't have a rich father behind you to support you in your future endeavors, you don't have much minimum capital to put down, but you might have a brilliant idea. So those ideas need to be developed. There should be, like if you have a good business plan, there, there should be easy access to credit. There should be opportunities to grow, uh, for growth. There should be little corruption. So all these things that would help youth to generate more income and develop businesses and uh, advance in uh, their own careers. Can I just very quickly just press Ambassador Gibson a couple of things? I think one of the things I often wonder about, and you just mentioned it, uh, which has to do with uh, India surpassing the U.S. in terms of trade and uh, investment. I believe China is also ahead of uh, the United mm -hmm. States. And I think one of the things that I often think about is why is it that the risk assessment of some international partners, as far as a risk, their risk assessment on uh, in Africa, seems to be lower than that of the United States? Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, um, it's a complicated question. First, it's trade. It's not investment, because in investment, right. we're sure. still uh, yeah. doing quite well. Um, look, first of all, Indian companies, Chinese companies, they're used to doing work with the bottom mm -hmm. of the pyramid. That's, they're used to working with people who have lower incomes. Their products are a better fit. Many American companies have to figure out, when I'm going overseas, how do I adjust what I'm offering to fit the, the economics of the market that we're entering? Um, the, um, the Chinese have had more support for companies doing it. It's been part of an overall plan. And I think, you know, one of the things the Obama administration has done very well is try to say to the American business community, we have a, you know, it's very sad that Congress is pulling back on XM support as we sit here, but providing the tools to help businesses go overseas, and particularly smaller businesses, mm -hmm. as Flory talked about, that, that need that assistance to, it, you know, Africa's a long way away, and it's, and then the other big factor, as I said earlier, is it's the markets are small. Uh, when we've got this big market here at home and they look at African markets, making that investment, they see the growth rates, but the actual size of the markets are still small and still fractured. And it's still, as the numbers uh, you showed, it's still a complicated place to do business. And I think that's an important point because one of the uh, we were talking about the market fragmentation uh, really and the impact on the decision that uh, corporate partners and other international partners make when they look at that fragmentation. Can, can I make one other point sure. on that, which I think is really 
critical around this, which is a number of countries, to one of the earlier points, are putting in localization requirements so that, you know, if, uh, you want to sell power, you've got to do a certain amount of localization. The problem is when every African country does it and they do it for the same goods, it makes it very difficult to have the skill to put in a, a plant to build wind turbines or a, whatever it may be. And again, I think this is one of the key positive steps Africa could take is say, if you build it in Africa, it doesn't matter which country, we're not going to, that counts as local. So that mm -hmm. across the continent, that will start getting people to say, okay, I can afford to put a manufacturing plant. And then they'll, they'll when the companies go look, they'll look at the index that the World Bank says, and where's the best place for me to do this? And that will start African countries trying to fix their regulatory regime so that they can start to attract those plants. Sure. Did you want to add anything to that? Um, I was just going to add, though, that, that part of the challenge, um, and I think it's, it's, it's a significant challenge, is that every country, all the ones I've visited, at least want to create those jobs and opportunities in their own borders for their own people. And even though uh, we are often talking to them about developing regional markets and um, supplying inputs along value chains where, you know, someone comes, puts a factory in one country in the region to process fruits and vegetables, and the other countries in the region then send their fruits and vegetables to that one plant that then gets sort of the economies of scale to be able to be competitive. But the problem is, is that every country in the region wants to have that production facility. Everyone wants that investment and sees it as valuable to their own economic and political um, uh, uh, future. So how, how we're able to show African countries that they can benefit even if they don't get um, the direct investment, that the indirect participation um, in, 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 in that investment is equally as valuable. And I think that um, more work needs to be done to be able to show Africans that um, th this, this can, that model can work and that everyone does not need to um, uh, basically go for the same things in the same market. Absolutely. And I think that's a key factor that you raised just there because uh, as I see it, um, a big challenge has to do with the fact that the rhetoric on regional integration is all positive across much of the continent. However, a lot of African countries still struggle with giving up their political sovereignty. And this is where the, the rub comes in on how you balance those two in order to move towards the sort of integration and these common benefits and um, the larger markets that we're talking about. So I think that's a really, really key point that you raise. All right, I know I said I was swinging this way. Uh, I'll take the lady over here and then the gentleman in the back, and I am coming, I see you. Hello, my name is Cameron Shaw and I'm with the U.S. Africa Chamber of Commerce. So, um, Mr. Gibbs, you mentioned earlier that South Africa has spent a lot on branding and then ultimately it, it wasn't worth it. But Mr. Sawari, you talked about how the U.S. media is also a culprit. Well, my question is who, I guess, who is the right um, entity to be working on the branding? Should it be the government? Should um, like, should the government of South Africa, for example, try to do its own branding, or should it say, well, we're going to try to find private companies and ask them to focus on branding, or, like, how much of a role should medias of other countries be playing, and, like, what sort of economic incentives, for example, would the U.S. media have to be involved in branding? Who should ultimately be responsible for it? Uh, I'll, do you want to? No, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I think what we're both saying, uh, and jump in if you disagree, is that branding doesn't work if the reality doesn't match the yes. brand. Uh, and so the real challenge is how do you create a product that makes either companies want to come invest or more importantly, to a point you made, makes the African diaspora that's here want to return home and bring the skills that they have because that's going to be the best economic opportunity that they're going to have to participate in those countries. So whether it's getting the rules of the road right so that people can invest and grow or putting in place good leadership, 
Um, that's the way to improve the brand. It's not the marketing dollars. It's actually doing the right things. Um, for those of you who haven't watched it, Fred Swanaker, who's the founder of the African Leadership Academy, does a great TED Talk on leadership, short, go S-W-A-N-I-K-E-R. And he talks about the fact that, you know, in, Afri in the United States, President Obama gets elected. I supported him. I fought hard for it. But as president, you can only do so much. Our institutions are so strong and ingrained um, that no matter how good a leader you are, you can only move things at the margin. For better or for worse, in Africa, leaders today can have a huge impact for the good or the bad because the institutions are not as developed. They don't have that strength and legacy. And I think, you know, part of branding is making sure that we build up those institutions over time so that it's not all in the hands of one leader to either for good or for bad. And I think, you know, with all the, I keep coming back to this with, it's why Fred created the African Leadership Academy because it's gonna take this next generation of leaders to be committed to that institutionalizing uh, democracy and then the brand will take care of itself. Okay. Did you wanna add? Uh, well, I, I just wanna give you an example of uh, one of the greatest scams that happened last year with branding and uh, I'm saying this as a Nigerian with full sense of responsibility and it was that branding of Nigeria as Africa's biggest economy. That's not true. Um, it was just, you know, misuse of uh, statistics, you know. I mean, you cannot have Nigeria branded as the biggest economy and you don't have electricity. You don't have jobs. The roads are in bad shape. Boko Haram is throwing bombs every day. Everybody knows that you can't brand that, you know. You cannot go and throw dollars. The little dollars that you should have spent constructing roads, you give them to U.S. Uh, PR companies because we spend a lot of money on them to help you brand your country. Uh, how do they want to brand the country? Yes, you know, have a bunch of conferences and you go on CNN. The money goes back to the same Western media that in the first place created the brand image problem for Africa. Uh, and so you give them all these contracts and they fly into the country and you know, before they could start their television, uh, I mean their mm -hmm. cameras, they don't have electricity. They can't get to travel to where they need to because there are no roads. So they come back and tell the real story, which is reality. But most importantly, how do you brand a country or a, a continent that its people are there to tell their own stories? As a matter of fact, anybody that knows Africa should know that Africans are the greatest storytellers uh, <laughs> in the world. So all you just need is to give Africans the right environment to exist and flourish, and they will tell their own stories, and they will tell it very, very well. That's the greatest branding you can have. Yes. Okay, I, I promise my brothers and sisters in this side that I'm going to come. I'll come back to you if we <coughs> have more time. So I think there's a lady right there. Oh, no? She's right here, sorry. She's in, white, in the white jacket down here about halfway through. Thank you. Um, my name is Hannah McCandless, and I am with the Center for American Progress, um, specifically the Enough Project. Um, <clears throat> so my question kind of builds uh, off of what was um, just said and, and goes to um, Ambassador, Ambassador Gibbs. You made a comment earlier about how um, you're not inviting investors to, li to northern Nigeria. You're inviting them to Lagos um, because of Boko Haram and the influence that they have there. And I think... Um, Unfortunately, part of what has colored this negative brand of Africa is, is conflict and humanitarian crisis. Um, and so I think we walk a thin line when we're talking about branding Africa. I think Ms. Lisa ref referred to the new brand Africa as this, you know, a potential for economic growth. But I want to ask um, the whole panel, but Ambassador Gibbs particularly, um, how do we ethically and practically promote this new brand Africa in Lagos when northern Nigeria is being torn apart by Boko Haram or the same can be said for you know how do we encourage investment in Khartoum when the Sudanese government is repeatedly bombing civilians in the Nuba Mountains? No, I mean, I, again, 
to be clear, I don't think there is a brand Africa. Uh, I think we need to start telling the specific stories of each country, just like we don't talk about a brand Latin America. We talk about what's going on in Venezuela or Brazil or Argentina. We need to be moving the conversation about Africa to what's actually happening in each of the countries. Um, you know, my the one of the guys I work with was trying to build a, a big facility in Sudan until Sudan in South Sudan until things blew up there. You know, that will take the people of South Sudan back. You know, twenty five, fifty, whatever number of years it is, people's lives are being destroyed. That is a reality. It's part, one part of the African story. It's a very different story than what's going on in Ethiopia, which is right next door. Now, Ethiopia is not perfect either. It's growing economically, but, you know, many people would argue around what's going on at the election and human rights issues are still very alive and well there. And I think, you know, President Obama going to Ethiopia is going to, there'll be very interesting conversations, a great economic opportunity. And I think he'll also talk about what the human rights challenges are. And I think we need as a, uh, a group to not think there is one Africa story. And even within one country, we're going to have to tell both the good and the bad in that story. I'm just going to put some lady right here. Oh. And then the lady in front of her. Hi, my name is Katie Proach, um, no affiliation. Um, I had a question um, for Mr. Soare, but also for the entire panel, if anyone would like to comment. Um, my interest is in, um, in, in this whole discussion of brand Africa is w um, what Africa is exporting to the, to the West, um, because we, we talk a lot about trade and investment. Um, and I, I just wonder if, um, in you gave the example in Nigeria, the um, the young people who were developing an application that um, located pizza shops in the area. Obviously, that's not going to compete with Google, and you're not going to export that specific application. But are there like what is the West doing to welcome um, more? exports from Ask Africa, but then also what is Africa doing to market not only to their own people, but also possibly to the West and other markets? Um, sorry, did you want to say something? I just Go wanted ahead. to talk about the trade yeah, piece. Yeah. Okay, we'll leave the rest to you. Um, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, so basically in terms of, 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 of what the Africans are shipping to the world. Part, part of the reason why um, Africa today still uh, uh, accounts for only about 3% of all world trade uh, is because of the types of products that they are indeed um, uh, exporting to the rest of the world. Um, many of them are uh, commodities and uh, on the lower end of the value chains. And so, um, uh, you know, um, for example, people don't know that I think more than 70% of African cashews are actually shipped to India for processing. Um, uh, most of Africa's diamonds um, go to also to India and other places to be uh, cut and polished. Um, so part of the issue is value addition for Africa. This, this is on the good side. This doesn't have to do with their services and applications and things. And, that, and that's very important that the services economy is one that's really uh, growing and important, not just for uh, advanced countries like the United States, you know, banking, financial services, distribution services, um, uh, all of that are really critical for making your goods even um, competitive. But I do want to say that um, uh, Africa's ability to capture uh, more of the value addition for themselves and projects that I know are underway, which are helping the Africans to um, move up the value chain, not to send raw uh, cocoa, but to send uh, cocoa powder, cocoa paste, and um, hopefully more chocolate. Um, that's going to help, and that also creates jobs all the <coughs> way back to the farmers, um, 
all the way, um, you know, sort of from farm to fork, as we would say. So that's really a critical piece, and 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 the work that um, U.S. businesses and entrepreneurs um, can do. Um, I know Rahama Wright is uh, one of the people who does this in the Shea uh, butter and other sectors as well. Is helping the Africans to. Um, uh, um, add value to their own products and get more of the benefit from trade um, in those products. Yeah, you. <laughs> I, I think you said most of what I would have loved to say. Uh, I mean, Africa is exporting a lot of things to the world. You can hardly mention any African country uh, that's not exporting something precious to the world. And I want to say quickly that uh, we need some level of respectability within the international trading system where uh, what Africa is sending to the world can also be accepted based on its value. Uh, I mean, we're talking about cocoa, which comes out of, uh, out of Ivory Coast a lot in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And most I saw on CNN, which is part of the media problem, which is like... Uh, this year, when uh, some guy went with chocolate to Ivory Coast and was showing it to farmers, have you ever seen this before? And the farmers, I mean, it was disgraceful, you know. Uh, and the farmers had never tasted chocolate before. And these are cocoa farmers. Yes, I mean, you can check this out. You can Google it. Uh, and that is where Africa breaks your heart, you know. And oil that has been coming out of Nigeria since 1956 until some five years ago, the largest producing oil producing state in Nigeria, Bayes, only had one, had one gas station. One gas station. So Africa is not, I don't understand why Nigeria does not have functional refineries, why we have to ship our oil to, you know, New Orleans or wherever they take it to, uh, to be refined. Only for Nigeria. Nigeria is the biggest importer of gas, gasoline today. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's the biggest source of corruption, you know, because sometimes these guys will just outrightly import water and deliver it as gasoline. That's Nigeria for you. That's the corruption story that we don't like to hear about. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, this, there needs to be reform, and this is where we have to also respect some of our colleagues and brothers and sisters and friends here who have taken uh, a position to challenge the World Trade Organization where some of these international trading injustices, I would say, are taking place, where a country in Africa will produce something, but it's never accepted here. But when you produce yours, even when it's substandard, it's accepted in Africa. Africa is a dumping ground for everything. Somebody was talking about India and China, the reason why they are shipping a lot. The reason is simple, because you had farmed out all of your manufacturing into China and India in an attempt to make profit. And when they perfected the process of making Gucci bags, they didn't come back to make it for Gucci anymore. They sent it to Africa. Same thing with India. You know, they were developing softwares, and you know, when they were kicked out, they went and created uh, their own what you call bootleg. In over time, the bootlegs are no longer bootleg anymore. But Africa needs to get there, and that's where leadership and governance is very, very. And I'm very, very serious about it. That African leaders or African must create or put in place leaders that know what they are doing. I mean, there are just too many buffoons running Africa, and I'm, I don't have any apologies in saying this. And until we get it right with leadership and governance, we're not going to have a lot of these things. We're just going to be producing mediocrity you know, all the time and celebrating mediocrity. We must get past that. There's no alternative to that, in my view. I do have to say, though, on, on, on the issue, the last point you made about uh, producing mediocrity, uh, I won't speak to it in terms of leadership, but um, uh, I do think that um, the issue of Africans being able to meet certain core standards for products that are going to be competitive either in regional markets, selling to each other, uh, selling to other developing countries, uh, India, Brazil, China, and ultimately also meeting the kinds of standards for products in 
um, developed markets like the U.S. And um, I, I, I do think that it's important that those uh, skills and the kind of uh, training that's needed to help Africans to make their products uh, uh, in a way that meets those standards. I don't know that that's about international trade and justices, but the fact of the matter is, is that even the Africans set standards for what comes into their countries, and they should. They should make sure that their citizens are also getting products that are safe, um, that are not going to be harmful. I've been in countries, and I won't say which ones, where you know things were being sold uh, to Africans, it was supposed to be milk, it really wasn't milk, babies were dying. This is why you set standards. And so um, I, I do have to say, you know, from where I sit, that um, setting and meeting standards is something that needs to happen uh, both in Africa uh, for their own products and their own um, uh, uh, safety of their um, uh, people as well as uh, on our side. And I think our responsibility through trade capacity building programs and technical assistance is to help Africans with that. Okay, okay I'm looking at the clock. We're running out of time. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take three questions, 30 seconds each. So please get to the point because we've got to wrap this up. Okay, so I'm going to give you 30 seconds. I'll start with the lady right there in yellow. The lady here has been waiting and the gentleman right here. 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, it's a question for Ambassador Gibbs. Nice meeting you again. I'm from South Africa. Uh -huh. And you're much aware of our land issue there, which is one of the reasons, um, major effects that contributed to the Marigana massacre. Um, we believe it's our land, it's our minerals. We should be owning them, not um, a mining company that's in London that we don't even know. So what would you advise us to do in pursuit of trying to rectify what the previous generation maybe missed a few points here and there in trying to handle the land issue and how, what advice would you give us in terms of um, not scaring investors and, and, and traders and running away from South Africa? Mm. So how would you advise us? Boy, anybody else want to take that question? Uh, <laughs> um, look, the, the land issues and particularly given South Africa's history are some of the most difficult issues there are and I think if you look next door to Zimbabwe, you can see a lesson in how not to do it. And the question is, what do you do? I mean, South Africa, you know, and for those of you who don't know the statistics, still the vast majority of wealth is held by white South Africans, even though they account for under 10 percent of the population right now. How do you, you know, and when Mandela came into power, he did an amazing thing where he said, we'll in order to keep the peace, we will allow, we'll get political freedom, but we're not going to force economic transformation on day one. We're going to do it over time. The United States is still trying to figure this out with our history of slavery 200 years later. South Africa is 25 years into this experiment um, of how do you transfer wealth from a historical inequity that, you know, is criminal. Um, and I don't have the answer to how to do that well. I think mm -hmm. you, you, you do it in a measured fashion, but I, uh, you know, you keep, keep working those rules. You keep trying to figure out the right way to get it done. But I don't think, I know we haven't figured it out back here very well. Um, and I, I always shied away from giving advice around that. That's a good point. Okay, just very quickly, 30 seconds, ma'am. Hi, uh, my name is Catherine Gillis, and I'm with the Millennium Project. I wanted to speak to something that was like several questions ago, but what you just said, Ms. Lizer, also applies. Um, I am hearing a lot of like what we should be doing to brand Africa so that the West will want to come in and invest in what we can get out of it, but I'm interested in what regulations there might be in place or any programs maybe with AGOA um, that ensure what's good for the African economy and African people so that we're not taking resources east to west like traditionally has always been the case and not in a way that is sort of as Mr. Suara was saying earlier, oh my gosh, feel good, like regulations, but more um, along the lines of like, I believe we do owe something Thank for you. responsibility. 
before you answer that question, I'll take the final question, then we'll mm -hmm. take the last mm -hmm. two, and I'll ask each of our speakers to take 90 seconds and give some final thoughts. Just one final thought. Sorry, there was a gentleman right there. Sorry. Um, my name is Cesar Siwale. I've actually been dying to take, get this microphone to just say congratulations to you because you're a product of UNSA and I'm from Lusaka, Zambia. So right. that was the first thing I wanted to say. Um, and then um, I'm here on vac vacation. Uh, I'd never seen 4th of July fireworks before. So I thought I'd come to the US um, and experience uh, this whole event. That's and a long way to come for fireworks. It is, it is. I hope you had a good seat. <laughs> and uh, somebody told me to come by this event, so I left my wife with my Zambian credit card. I uh, hope it was the right decision. But uh, th the interesting thing I found in this whole event is that it's so impersonal, and it's just statistics and legislations and theory, and a bit you've touched on the politicians, which have agreed completely, and I found it very entertaining, regardless which country it is. But in Zambia, I run a financial advisory business. We cover Southern Africa, uh, so Zambia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, those sort of countries. And there's a lot more hope when you look at it individually on an individual cases. And some of the things you're talking about here, it's almost like you want to build the vehicle and then everything will come. We brought Pizza Hut to Zambia last year. When we met them in, in May, they, they laughed. They'd never heard of Zambia before. Today, we're building a center hub so that all the inputs are made in Zambia and distributed into the region, and we're not using South Africa as a hub. The one question I had was in relation to Agoa. And the concern that I have with Agoa is, on the ground, none of us know it. And I've been doing this for 15 years. There isn't a single contact place that you can go to. We don't know which products you can export and so on and so forth. And we think that's a bit of the link. So on the legislative side, I think it makes sense to the politicians, but. Sorry, seriously, uh, we, we, get, we get the gist of your point. Uh, we, we have a reception right after this so we can continue this dialogue. But let me turn uh, over to our speakers and I think I'll just go in the same order in which they speak. So 90 seconds to answer, close off, final thought. Shawara, can you do 90 seconds? It's difficult. <laughs> uh, well, I just want to say that uh, Africa has uh, products that Africans have manufactured that have uh, stood the test of time. Uh, when I walked into this country and bought a pair of jeans, it looked inferior to you know, the clothes that I used to wear in Africa that could withstand all kinds of things, including sometimes bullets. Uh, I'm telling you. But, and you wonder why those kind of products are not allowed to circulate widely around the world. Africa has products. I, I just want to use that to say that there are things that Africans know how to do very well. And if we were not subjugated internationally, we could sell them and make a lot of money for Africa. And Africa is not just reduced to this very port of place where everybody goes to take resources. One of the greatest questions I get asked, and most embarrassing, is, you know, the U.S. people say, you know, look at the Chinese, you know. And I'm asking myself, when is Africa going to go to the U.S. and be the dominant uh, business there? Or go to China and be the business, uh, dominant business there? And go to India? That Africa, non, <coughs> not, you know, for Africa to have the global power, to sell what it has respectively. We don't have that, and we must get that. And that is why, in this debate, I did not agree with the idea of being branded. I don't want Africa as a brand. I want Africa as a continent. I want the dignity of the African man and woman to be respected to the extent that we are respected for the things that we produce. And if you want to know what we produce, Call another conference for a future discussion. We have a lot that we have we can sell to the world, including stories. <laughs> that, you know. Great stories. Thank you, Shawari. Yes. Ms. Flory. So I, th I think what I want to end with is the, um, the power of trade, the ability of having products and services that you can, in fact, sell to other people as an engine for 
uh, economic growth. There, there are no countries in the world um, that are um, uh, uh, advanced or industrialized or whatever the right terminology is that haven't at some point produced products that they sold to others. Uh, the United States at one point had um, uh, a leather footwear industry. We used to produce apparel. We used to produce televisions, et cetera, et cetera. Those things have all moved to other places over time. And um, uh, those production factors, that's what kind of makes global trade happen. We don't make leather shoes anymore. We don't make, um, uh, produce um, uh, most apparel. Um, but somewhere else in the world are factories which are producing those products. And so I just want to end by saying that it's my view, maybe it's because I'm an eternal optimist, but I think this is Africa's time um, to be a, a, a production center for uh, many of the goods that the world um, will, will need. And um, uh, uh, not to be flip, but you know, until people are walking around with you know, no clothes, no shoes on, no chairs to sit in, no glasses to drink from, um, everything you see here, everything you have on, um, your jewelry, your eyeglasses, your tie, your dress, was made by somebody somewhere, everything. <coughs> so uh, my view is that this is Africa's time um, to basically uh, be a competitive supplier of products to the world that will drive transformative and sustainable growth in Africa. Trade is the engine for that growth. Thank you. Ambassador Gibbs? So first off, if anybody wants to go sample my favorite South African product, Go to Nando's and, uh, and get some good chicken. Uh, either that or you can go to Rodman's and buy some very good South African wine. Um, you know, I guess the, the final message I'd leave, and I look around at the audience here, and as one of the people said, the old people, uh, which I am, uh, um, you know, we, ha we haven't done such a good job. Uh, you know, for all the young people in this room, and I agree with Flory, I think now is Africa's time, and whether you're some of the young African leaders who are here as part of the Mandela Fellowship or you're young Americans who are interested in Africa, now is your moment. I mean, I think the continent is exploding. There's 54 different countries that each have a different story, and and it's being shaped not by us, but by you. Uh, and I think now is your moment to go grab it. Thank you, Ms. Valentina. Yes, so as we agree here and as it's been discussed, um, Africa as a continent has a lot of potential, a lot of untapped opportunities, a lot of room for growth, but uh, the sad reality is that, uh, for example, according to the 2013 numbers, I'm getting a personal uh, with the numbers <laughs> again, but the tease out stories out of these numbers, uh, the GDP of uh, in, the U in, bi in billions of US dollars of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, 47 economies, equals that of two countries, of the Netherlands and Switzerland. While the population in these two countries is only 2.8% of the population of 47 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And to me, this is not where we want to see Africa. Um, I expect um, African countries to continue to develop uh, favorable environment for small business because small domestic business generates gro growth and employment for use and helps to boost economy. So I hope to see continued pace of active reform over time. I want to see strong citizen engagement in rulemaking and democratic processes, stronger institutions, and I do believe that Africa will un unveil its uh, full potential in the near future. Thank you very much. Let me just um, I think we've had a really, really good uh, and very rich uh, discussion today. Um, but before I thank our speakers, I'll try and do a little bit of justice to some of the key points that I thought I heard uh, um, during the session. But before I do this, sure, I have to disagree with you on something. And we can take this outside after the fact. <laughs> um, you, know, you talked about Africa being uh, poor. And I really must start there at, at some point, you know, the people living in poverty. I think we really need to unpack that and differentiate it. 
No, I didn't say that. Oh, I thought you did. No. Okay, I'm attributing things to you, then I take it back. <laughs> uh, I, I, I do take it back, then I won't go then. Mm -hmm. All right. So let, let me start with what I, what I thought I heard. Brand Africa. I think one of the key messages I'm taking out of this discussion today is that there is no such thing as Brand Africa, and we would be doing ourselves all a favor by turning away and moving away from Brand Africa. We know that this is something that's stuck in the minds of the vast majority of people when they think about Africa, but really we need to see if we can move the discourse away from this one brand Africa to getting a good understanding of the continent at the individual country level, because that's when you really start to brand the countries. Having said that, there was an interesting point that was made uh, by uh, the lady at the back there who talked about some of the benefits of having a brand Africa that can we move towards this individualized brand Africa for the uh, different African countries while retaining some of the benefits that accrue from speaking about Africa as one? And I think that's a challenge that we can continue to look at and unpack. The second issue that I got from the discussion today that in many ways our image of Africa's brand today is, oops, I'm in trouble, uh, that our image of Africa's brand today is that it is not based on substance, uh, that it's too artificial, and that if we really need to begin to understand what is it that informs this image of Africa, we need to get to the substance of it, but get to the substance of, of it at that um, country level. And a number of issues came up. The governance issue. I absolutely have to agree with Shora on this one. I wouldn't use the words that he used, but I absolutely have to agree with Shora on this one, that leadership uh, is a key issue in Africa, and in some African countries there is a leadership deficit. And until we get that right, it's going to be very, very difficult to address some of these issues that we're talking about. The second issue that I heard is about institutionalization. Uh, that because so <coughs> much of politics on the continent remains around the personal, and especially around the personal of the person who occupies the executive office, it becomes very difficult to build the, the, the governance uh, institutions, to institutionalize um, the mechanisms of governance. And so that's a second area that we need to focus on if we're really going to talk about getting to the substance of what makes Africa. But I thought one of the issues that came up, uh, and, and I think Shora was extremely eloquent on this, was in talking about Africa's history of being a net consumer of economic models. That this has really, really disrupted a lot of what is going on on the continent. You had the African continent go through the structural adjustment policies. Well, we started off at independence, really going through the socialist uh, development uh, models, somebody else's models. Then we went to the structural adjustment policies. Uh, now we're into the open and, and free markets. But what you do see is that Africa has not had the opportunity to really continue long enough with any one of these models it has not really had the opportunity to internalize and take ownership of it, and that this has caused a, a bunch of the dislocation. But what we do see is the continent moving in the same direction on, on, on any number of these issues in the economic space. And I think that's a good thing. We also see Africa's voice rising on that uh, in the economic space. So I think that's, uh, that's important. The media. I think this came through very powerfully, that the media really does play a critical role in, in shaping Africa. We talk the image of Africa. We talked a little bit about some of the issues that we could do to counter uh, this powerful force and uh, project other images of Africa, based, of course, on the realities. And I think that's the underlying uh, question there, that we really need to get to the realities. And I liked that you were talking about some of the things that's happening in Africa and the non-traditional media, so to speak, and happening at the local and micro levels in terms of really informing this uh, new brand of what African countries are about and challenging that narrative. So I think that was an important point. Somebody raised the issue of conflict and humanitarian crisis. Again, I go back to our earlier point that you, you, you do have to unpack. Yes, there are nine, nine of the 16 United Nations peacekeeping missions are in Africa, but all of those are peacekeeping missions that are at various stages. Uh, you know, you still have a peacekeeping mission in Liberia. Liberia, we hope, is on an upward trajectory and moving forward, so even though there is a peacekeeping. So we have to bear that in mind. Uh, there are also certain countries where those peacekeeping missions are. It's not the entire African continent, again, going back to the point that was made earlier on. Uh, we talked about the fragmentation, the regional integration, uh, that this is a key issue. Africa needs to figure out a way of expanding markets and making itself competitive in the global mm -hmm. arena. 
I thought that was a really powerful message that I came across from um, all of you. Uh, we did talk about um, corruption. We talked about the importance of focusing on youth. But I thought what was also a powerful message was um, in the presentation that we heard on the economic front was Ambassador Gibbs talked about uh, corporate sector's desire to engage in Africa. So that's there and that's something we can build on. But he also addressed very, very directly some of the core concerns that international, the international corporate sector has. Ms. Mizer talked about US engagement and on, particularly on AGOA, which is the underpinning of our trade engagement with Africa, and that this renewal gives us some certainty, something that we can build on to improve and enhance. Mm. And I think that's really powerful. So how do we take advantage of this opportunity? We now have 10 more years uh, to, to work this issue. That was really, really critical. But there was a point that, uh, and I want to finish off by talking to the point that um, Valentina made. Actually, before I get there, one of the things that came out in all of the discussion was the role of youth in Africa. Let's not forget that role. Those of us who are getting gray hairs as we look to the next generation, they have an opportunity. So we start engaging them in some of the things that are happening now. We start listening out to, for their voices uh, in some of the issues that help to shape the trajectory of the continent. And I think would be well advised uh, to take that on board. And then with Valentina's presentation that I really liked and I thought was a really powerful message to end on, has to do with the improvements that are being made in the regulatory environment to make engagement in the business sphere possible for ordinary African citizens. I have always believed that ex external parties can only bring extra value added, but the real change has to come from within Africa. Africans have to own it. And so we think this is uh, absolutely critical that we build on these regulatory um, improvements, these reforms that have been made, and we've seen the countries where this is happening. Can we take those lessons from these countries and get them to other countries? Sometimes it's easier for an African country to take a lesson from another African country than for a Western partner to go out and say, this is what you should be doing. And absolutely, I agree with that. I agree with that. So there are wonderful uh, lessons from the continent. How do we build on those lessons to really uh, continue to enhance um, that progress? A lot of really good issues uh, that came out of this uh, session. And what I wanted to talk about now as we look ahead is we touched on the surface of these issues. We have, through the very generous funding of Mr. Brown and Brown Capital, received uh, some funds to really explore a bunch of these issues more in depth so we can have the discussions that Shawari was talking about. We can have a discussion about many of the issues that have been uh, raised here. And so it now gives me a great pleasure to introduce Mr. Eddie Brown, who will talk a little bit to us about this Brown Capital Management Africa Forum, which will be launched in uh, September of this year to address many of the issues that have been raised here, and we hope that you will be a part of that. Mr. Brown, CEO, Chairman, and Founder of Brown Capital. Mark is yours, sir. Thank you, Mandy. Let me see if my wife is correct, that I'm pretty good on my feet because coming in here, I had no idea what I was going to say. So let's do it this way. I have three minutes. So in three minutes, I'm going to make four points. The first point is Congressman Harmon's predecessor, Lee Hamilton, a few years ago, I got a letter sitting in my office, doing my job, managing money, and it said, the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars have selected you and your wife to be offered an award. Periodically, we do these dinners around the country. We'd like to do one in Baltimore. We'd like to recognize the work that you have done in the Baltimore region, in the state of Maryland, for an award for public service. So I had never heard of the Woodrow Wilson Center. But I checked it out and I said, wow, this is really worth accepting. So we accept it. The next year, I got a call, said that we we're putting together 
something called the National Cabinet, a group of people who really care about the center, would like to support it in financial ways and other ways, and would like to invite you and your wife to be one of 15 inaugural members of the National Cabinet. So we accept it. Along the way, I've learned something that Jane Harmon has said on many occasions, and that is this is an intellectual candy store. Just an incredible group of intellectuals, scholars from around the world, and I've just learned so much over those years. Now, sometimes the moon and the stars align. And they aligned for me last year in three ways. You know, I noticed over the years serving on that national cabinet that there was a lot of programming on Brazil, on China, on Russia, various parts of the world, but very little on the continent of Africa. The stars aligned in this way. The Woodrow Wilson Center hired a superstar energetic and brilliant. Would you guess who I'm talking about? <laughs> Monday. The second, yeah, that's worth a hand. The second alignment is that President Obama did last August something that I don't think had been done, an Africa summit. You know, I think it was 25 leaders from around the world, from the continent. Yeah, 50, 50, I'm sorry, okay. Mm -hmm. And the last thing is that I sensed that the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars was willing to make a commitment to heighten the programming and the visibility on the continent. So those three things, I talked to my colleagues at Brown Capital Management, and I said, you know, we pride ourselves in being able to look ahead the next three, five, ten years in doing our investing, figure out what's going to happen and kind of be ahead of the curve. I said, this is an incredible opportunity. And the word that was used more than once is now is Africa's time. So we agreed to financially support something, and Monday mentioned in September, it will be called the Brown Capital Management Africa Forum. And there'll be several of these each year, maybe two, three. We're not quite sure, but very substantive, focused on Africa. So we are very pleased to be able, and I got my colleagues to agree to put up a few bucks, that this is something worth doing because the time is now. So sitting there, I said, gee whiz, how many times have I been to Africa? Where have I been? You mentioned 54 countries. I listed eight, I think it's been 10, I couldn't think of the others, but South Africa, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Uganda, Senegal, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania. But each time, the four times I think it was, it's been on vacation. So here's what I predict. I predict in the next few years, I will go, we will go to several other Africa countries, maybe back to some of these, but it'll be for two purposes. It will be for vacation and business. Thank you. Mr. Brown, thank you so much. I uh, just wanted to add after your remarks that really your support of the Africa program is greatly appreciated. I have, on a personal level, uh, benefited from your personal support of me, and that is greatly appreciated as well. You don't know it yet, but you're a role model and a mentor. So thank you. And uh, with that, I just wanted to say, please, we hope as many of you will be able to join us going forward as we continue to do this programming in Africa. We really want to focus on moving the dialogue forward and actually coming up with recommendations and options that enhance and make things better in terms of our engagement with the continent, in terms of what the continent is able to do for itself. And your views are absolutely uh, critical to that. And I thought our speakers today just did a fantastic job in terms of raising the issues. So
Thank you very much. Uh, we will now continue the discussion. We have a mix and mingle going on for um, 30 minutes out there, but before we go, I just wanted to take this opportunity also to thank the Africa program team, Elizabeth, Grace, Virginia, Sophia, and Margot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please join us. I am. You took off all your jewelry to speak. I know. Everybody calls me.